Please welcome President and COO, Maury McIntyre. Good evening. So this is usually the part of the night where I come out to welcome you to the theater and tell you a little bit about the event that we're about to do, and we're gonna get to that. But since I have you here, I thought I'd do a quick informal survey now that the first round of Emmy voting has stopped. Uh, so I hope you'll indulge me just a little bit. Uh, first off, show of hands, how many of you here tonight are actually Television Academy members? Great, I, I assume the rest of you are guests and not just random audience members from the Lamleys who wandered in. <laughs> It'll be a very different evening for you. We did see The Incredibles here over the weekend, but we're not gonna be showing it tonight. Um, so I'm not gonna ask the question, uh, don't wanna embarrass anybody, but I do hope that those members here tonight, uh, that those of you who are here, actually voted. Uh, we did close uh, voting yesterday. Um, I want to remind you all, second round voting will start on August 13th. We'll run for two weeks, so please, please, please vote then. Uh, and nominations will be announced live from this theater on July 12th. So very excited about all of that, and thank you again for participating uh, in all of our judging. Uh, I do want to see a show of hands, and this is actually for all audience members. Uh, can I see who here actually attended at least one for your consideration event, either here or across town or in New York, so quite a few of you. Okay, how many of you here attended more than two of those events? Quite a lot of you did that too. Well, we did have a record number this year, so again, uh, thanks to those of you who came out to see it. Um, we, we heard a lot of great feedback about that. Uh, other question, how many of you here watched a program on a DVD screener that you received in the mail, either <laughs> from us at the uh, Emmy Magazine or from those boxes that we all received. Okay, that's great. How many of you here watched a program uh, via an online platform? Uh, either again, the Television Academy's For Your Consideration site or one of our partner sites. Good, good to see. So we're gonna be actually doing some surveys uh, throughout the rest of the year. We may do some additional focus groups. We did some at the end of last year. If you are interested in providing feedback, we really, really, really do value it. So please do volunteer if you get an email about it. We do hope to hear from you. And, and you don't have to wait for a survey or a focus group. We would love to hear from you now. If you've got something that you like, if you've got something you don't like, if there's a staff member you wanna praise, if there's a staff member who is never gonna happen, was rude to you, anything like that, Please, 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 you can go online to televisionacademy.com slash contact. That's actually the easiest way for us to receive that information because then it, we can make sure it gets to all of the appropriate parties who need to see it. I can't guarantee you we answer every email, but we do read them all and we do value them immensely. So uh, again, this helps us so much to know how to service you guys better, to know what works for you, what's not working for you. So please, please, if you've got that feedback, we really do want to hear it. Okay, tonight. Tonight, we are actually here to talk about mentorship. Um, Hollywood, as they say, is a relationship-driven town. Um, and unfortunately, for the past year and a half, two years, we've been hearing a lot about the bad relationships. Um, it, it is vitally important that those stories get brought into the light, absolutely, uh, so that we can hold those who abuse uh, their power or, or, or take advantage of their position in a relationship to stop them, to replace them, remove them, hopefully rewire them in some way. But tonight, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the good relationships, to talk about those people who actually use their position or their privilege to help those who are just learning the ropes, to give a boost to those people who are just starting to climb the ranks. And you're gonna hear from uh, professionals across the television industry who understand the value of or who have even benefited from mentorship themselves. Before we begin, I do want to give a shout out to Tony Carey, who I think is in the audience, uh, on our Television Academy Activities Committee, and to Dave Mandel, who's one of our panelists tonight. Th they really have been spearheading getting this event to happen tonight. We're really thankful for that. Uh, I also want to give just a huge thanks to all of the panelists that are here tonight, as well as the many industry professionals you'll hear from through videos throughout the evening. Now, the Television Academy and its foundation are committed to fostering the next generation of television's leaders. And we really promote this idea of mentorship through the foundation's internship program. Uh, this year's class of interns, 75% of whom are female, and over half of whom, over half of whom are persons of color, have just started working with their host companies. And we hope 
We really hope that this is just the beginning of a long and industrious career for them. Here is just a little bit more information about that foundation internship program. Thank you so much for coming. The Television Academy Foundation Internship was genuinely the start of my career. It put me inside an actual writer's room where I was able to sit with the writers, watch them work, and just watching it made me go, okay, I want to do this. I would walk by the Shonda Rhimes posters every day at USC, and I remember calling my mom saying, it'd be crazy if I get the internship and get placed at Shondaland. The moment I got the call was really surreal, honestly, but she said, hey, you're a Television Academy intern. And then right after it, she said, hold your breath. And I was like, okay, what is it? And she was like, you're at Shondaland. And it was like a dream come true. I was on the show How to Get Away with Murder while I was at Shondaland. And everybody there was like super nice and welcoming and being in the writer's room for the three weeks that I was there was amazing. One of the benefits of the internship program that I love is that you meet so many people. I learned so much from that internship. The work process, the creative process, it was the best experience of my life. The internship program is for eight weeks and I came in working as a development intern. So I worked with the executive assistants and their bosses of just creating new content, learning how to pitch, learning what sells show, learning different formats, going out in the field. And three weeks in, I got pulled aside and it was offered a full-time job. I grew up in Honduras. I came to this country when I was 11 years old. Someone mentioned to me, you are a creative writer. So I began researching and I, and I found uh, screenwriting and I, I, I just immediately knew it. I mean, this is the way that I want to help my people, just show what I want to say about them. One of the things I love about the Television Academy Foundation's internship program is the number of diverse voices it's bringing to television. We really focus on what they want to do. And so sometimes they'll spend a little time in the development process, then they'll move over to the post process. If one of the interns is participating in the development process, they have a full seat at those meetings. We make television programs for everybody, and uh, we have to have a diverse workforce to do that job well. I had to go back to college. So went back to college, and then they were like, hey, we have a position here, do you want it? And I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, I do. For the program to be continued, I think is, is vital. It, it gave me a career, and I think it's going to continue doing that for decades to come, I hope. This internship program changed my life and made me realize that I can be in the industry. Had it not been for this internship, I would not be able to have the confidence and experience I have right now. If you're looking to make a difference, come support the Television Academy Foundation Internship Program. It absolutely was one of the best career moves ever. Please welcome Emmy-winning showrunner of Veep, David Mandel, and writer, producer, actor from the league and Veep, Paul Shear. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, well, this is going to be a fun night. I know you know a little bit about it, but we're going to be talking about how people got started, who mentored them. And I have to say, Dave, like your career... Thank you for mentoring me, Paul. <laughs> you know, you learned a lot. Uh, no, really, everything I know, this man. So thank you. I wanted to, that's why I brought you, you know, out here. And, and I'm glad to be here to talk about all the experience I gave Dave. Uh, you, you have, like, the best comedy career like that you can look at it's you know it's television Te <laughs> my, my movie work is horrific um <laughs> well, right, let's, 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 we'll focus on tv right so you thank you, you. Go, god you bless go from yeah. saturday night live to seinfeld to curb and now you're show running veep these are all like seminal seminal comedy shows and anyone who's ever worked in comedy knows that it's this kind of a scary space to get into and you can kind of be eaten alive and you've kind of worked at the hardest places and only come out seemingly stronger for it. Well, but no. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, you know, the good news is, I mean, I, I was always a fan of every place I've ever been. I guess I was really lucky enough to be a huge fan of the shows. Right. I, you know, most of those shows were things I kind of joined in process. So that's definitely sort of a, I guess, a pattern, if you will, right. in my career. I'm joining these things that I was already just an, a huge fan of. And yet, despite that, I guess I never, I never went into it worrying like, how am I going to do it? Which right. I don't know. Maybe it was just stupid. Well, no, but it, <laughs> it, well, no, because I think. But you also come from this background. Like, you graduated Harvard. You were in the like prestigious like Harvard Lampoon. Like it was like the who's who of comedy has come out of the Harvard Lampoon. And so I also feel like 
that gives you a little bit of, not an ego, but you come in knowing that you're good, right? The thing, you know, because obviously, look, uh, if people are interested in this and you know about the lampoon, I think people fall into two categories, which is, oh, another lampoon guy, or at worst, kind of like, you know, F you all, you lampoon guys, right. and sort of like, why do you think you should have jobs and whatnot? And what I've always tried to explain is, first of all, nobody should be just given a job, obviously. But what I will say is, being in the lampoon was kind of like being in a writer's room for a couple of years right. before I was ever in a writer's room. And what I mean by that is, bad ideas, you got the shit kicked out of you, and you were sort of made fun of, and those ideas were sort of hung around your neck for like four years later, right. you remember that terrible joke, much <laughs> like being in a writer's room. And so coming, basically I graduated from college having the experience of having learned to, I have to think of that other joke, the right. joke that not everyone can think of, for, for you know, whether it was sort of like comedy alpha dog or, or just a fear of, I don't wanna be made fun of, yes. it sort of forced that next, I guess, level of thinking, and that's truly what the Lampoon, I mean, the Lampoon is not a mentor, but what it sort of produces within you. Well, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it takes you out of that place of writing by yourself yes, and puts much you so. in the thing where you have to... It puts to... you with like-minded people. I mean, I'm sure it's like being in a great, you know, group or something. It yeah. puts you with like-minded people that you can do stuff with, but you, like, honestly, you do kick the shit out of each other in a good way. Yeah. And, yeah, and then I also feel like, you know, I come from the Upright Citizens Brigade, and we all kind of support each other and kind of move up, and one of your first jobs was like a, uh, a Lampoon, yeah. uh, like a comedy central like document like a mockumentary right which if you again hate the lampoon this is not going to make you any happier <laughs> which was the lampoon did a uh, a television project this would have been and again now you're going to hate this also this would have been between my uh, junior and senior year oh, wow. it was a summer okay. project um <laughs> And, that's a great, uh, yes, that's a great exactly. Internship. The Lampoon yeah. had had a history of doing like magazine parodies, right. and this was their first TV parody. And it was called MTV Give Me Back My Life, a Harvard Lampoon parody. Okay. It was a fake 10th anniversary documentary of MTV. And what it, it was made by the brand new Comedy Central, because there had been Ha right. and the Comedy Channel. Right. And like Time Warner was losing $10 million a year and like Viacom was losing $10 million <laughs> a year. And they said, what if we made one place that we each lost only $5 million <laughs> each? And just to really date myself, it was like, to get Comedy Central, you had to like pay an extra two dollars and forty three cents right, yes. to your cable company. It, it wasn't just on the dial. So it was this show that nobody ever got to see. But I got down to Comedy Central um, in New York. A bunch of us wrote it up in Massachusetts, and then actually Jeff Schaefer and Alec Berg, who right. you you know, who yes. were, were my also longtime writing partners, we went down to New York and sle they slept on my parents' floor Amazing. and we basically then produced the show. And what was truly incredible, just to go back to it, was we walked in the first day and um, in an office there at Comedy Central acting as sort of a, I guess, comedy consigliere to the whole network, but okay. this project also was Al Franken. And I worked with Al on that project and then the following summer, he hosted comedy coverage of the Democratic and Republican conventions. Okay. Brought me back for that, and wow. then really, um, you know, definitely on the list of my, you know, mentors. Well, yeah. You know, I just talking about that because Al Franken obviously had a huge impact on Saturday Night Live on camera. Yeah. He was like one of those writers that was you knew he was a writer and he was a performer. And when you come in and work with him, are you a little bit in awe of him? I, I was fully in awe. I mean, I was. I was that kid that was, you know, desperately trying to stay up on Saturday nights. Right. I had, they did in like 1979, they did this Saturday Night Live script book that looked like a real yeah, like, yeah, yeah. book of the script of the show. Uh, the Hill and Weingar, I mean, I was a real comedy nerd yeah. too, backstage at Saturday Night Live. So I knew all of the, the Franken and Davis stories, you know, how they got hired by Lauren, all that kind of stuff. And I knew their sketches, you know, right. like uh, the, the Nixon, the Final Days sketch and whatnot. So to sort of meet him, not just befriend him, but then also like, you know, work yeah. with him and really just started, I mean, honest, honestly, from day one, I mean, just start learning from him. It yeah. was kind of amazing. Like, I mean, it, and that's the thing, I feel like, uh, would, did you find that you were like-minded or was it just sort of like, he just liked, like, what do you think attracted the fact that he brought you to the next thing? We definitely had just, I think, like a real similarity of like, 
kind of comedy right. just taste, I guess. We right. laughed at a lot of the same stuff. And one thing that Al did that I, I treasure to this day, and I, I, I think about it a lot, Al, there are shows um, where you hear like, it's really funny show and people are just miserable. It's right. like a comedy coal mine. Yeah. Um, you know, they're just, they're in there and they're just making themselves sick, working right. for yeah. like an hour on a line or something. And Al is certainly prepared to do the work, but Al laughed. He laughed at your stuff, his stuff, he was not afraid to laugh while he was working. Right. And it was a real sort of like, again, I was like that, but didn't know you could be like that. And, yeah. it, and it just sort of opened things up in a really wonderful way. Well, it makes it playful. Yeah. I always, I always uh, am confused about like, why is it miserable when you're making comedy? Is it not going to make yeah. good comedy when everyone's just staring at their no, laptops? No, it's that thing of like, oh, yeah. and it's just like, no. <laughs> I mean, and by the way, I do that too sometimes. Right. But the idea of laughing at it was wonderful. And he was really the first guy, more than anyone I'd ever been around, that was absolutely fearless. Right. Um, and I don't know, maybe we could sort of now sit here and go, his fearlessness with like that joke is sort of the yeah. trouble. But I guess to, I'll simply say to, to myself, who anyone who knows Al really well, I keep hitting my mic, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, it just like he just was not afraid to make himself look terrible, right. you know. Just yeah. there was a fearlessness as opposed to sort of mild milk toast kind of like I don't want to offend. Al was very happy well, to offend in a wonderful way. I mean, he, yeah. he basically got fired from from Saturday Night Live because he just ripped on the president of NBC. Yeah, what's that, Fred Silverman? Fred, yeah. yeah, like just ripped on yeah. him continually week after week. So when Lauren left, he was like, "Well, Al Franken should take over," and Fred Silverman was like, "No." Like yeah, he, uh, <laughs> but I mean, so like, but that's that's ballsy to do. I a sketch once. He had been on, like, I don't know, I think it was like Spring Break. Mm -hmm. I don't think it aired. I'm trying to remember. I really don't think it aired. Right. We definitely took it to dress. He had had like some horrific experience in a rental car place right. with like budget rent a car, and so it was like <laughs> we did this sketch, and it was like about, and he wrote it. I did not right. write it. Um, it was him. It was like. Gudget rent a car, right. <laughs> and the whole sort of joke was about the fact that clearly he had had a bad experience on his spring break, right. <laughs> and was using his position as a Saturday Night Live writer That's great. to basically yeah. <laughs> shit on them, and 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 it just that was Al in a really wonderful way. Yeah. So Al brings you uh, yeah. into Saturday Night Live now, and now Saturday Night Live is this other monster of, yes. you know, this is this, you know, you go from one institution, which is Lampoon, to now this other hallowed hall, which is SNL. Right. What year are you in SNL? Uh, I was there 92 to 95, which was sort of the tail end of like Dana Carvey, Phil okay. Hartman, and the rise of Sandler, Farley, Spade, so those guys. great time yeah. to kind of and be And 92 there. was the election year, which was amazing. Okay. So you had Dana doing Ross Perot and Bush, wow. and you had uh, Phil doing uh, Clinton, and actually one of the big sketches Al and I wrote together was uh, Clinton jogging into McDonald's, oh, yeah, and yeah. explaining Somalia as he yeah. eats stuff, all, yeah. you know, like warlords as he yeah. eats the stuff. Um, oh, wow. And yeah, I mean, you know, I, I got to write that with him. Yeah, yeah. And, and I feel like, and you know, SNL, I always hear the idea is like, you know, you, you live and die by the table read to yeah. a certain extent, and you know, and, and sort of you get that respect by those things, and so when you're at SNL, Jim Downey is a big yeah. figure there. Um, Jim Downey, long time, I guess, first head writer, then producer, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Uh, by the way, another Lampoon guy, or is that yellow already? Yeah, I know, yeah. Word? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'll go as quick as I can. Uh, Jim Downey, and this is with no apology, uh, you know, my, my other mentors, yeah. uh, Al, Larry David, who maybe we'll get to, maybe we won't. We'll get one um, line about Larry Jim David. Downey <laughs> is the funniest human being on the face of the earth. I yeah. don't know how else to say this. And I told this story in a book once, which is working with Jim Downey was like the way, like, Chess masters play chess where they like don't even need the board. Right. Like where they're like they can, the, they're yeah. like forty moves ahead. And I remember watching him. I always tell the story. I, I hope this is I haven't told it to all of these people. Um, <laughs> we were writing a sketch. John Malkovich was the host, okay. and we did a sketch because he had kind of a funny looking face in a good way. Yeah. Uh, and he looked like one of the Menendez brothers. So we did <laughs> him and Rob Schneider as the Menendez brothers. This is the early days of Court TV. Yeah. And the joke, the the idea was that their defense was that there were two heretofore other unknown Menendez brothers <laughs> who had been locked in a basement right. and had done the killing, had done the murder. And what they would do is they were sitting like this, right. and they would go, where are these other Menendez brothers? We're going to go get them. And they would get up and leave the courtroom, and they would come back and switch sides <laughs> and say, I'm Jose Jr. and Alfredo Menendez, and you're not just the other two Menendez brothers, right. 
uh, no, we are not. And the whole time, the Chiron is just trying right. to keep up with this story. <laughs> and I sat in there with Jim at like four in the morning, yeah. and I swear he was just dictating it. We weren't wow. writing it. Yeah. He was just, it was like the sketch had been performed, and he was just like, if, if, like if you watched it on TV and were telling someone yeah. how to write it down. And I, just so many of the things on... Um, on like Saturday Night Live are because of Jim and just styles of comedy. Well, too. like I mean, and, yeah. and this may be hard to kind of distill, but what do you think you took from him? There's a that, thing that Jim did, and I'll sorry, I didn't. I'm no, trying to no, just because I'm so yeah, yeah, nervous, no, yeah. I'm gonna like pull us off the stage. Um, <laughs> there's a sketch that I'm sure everybody knows, which is the, uh, and I wasn't there for it, right. but it's a Jim Downey sketch that I've always loved. Um, by the way, he's the change bank guy. Right, yes, the yes. And I think he wrote that, and that's just pure Jim Downey, just the sort of the repetition of the nonsense. Yeah. Um, he used to say about commercial parodies, it was a uh, non-existent problem, yeah. uh, uh, like an and then like not not good, not right, good yeah, like, solution. Yeah, yeah like um, a bad solution yeah, for a non-existent, non-existent problem. problem. Yeah. But um, he did, the, you guys know the uh, uh, Farley as the Chippendale dancer yes. auditioning with uh, yeah. Patrick Swayze. Yeah. The Jim Downey part of that is, as they're doing it, it's the fact that as they're all watching Farley, how often they like are writing notes down right. and almost like really thinking about it, and then the incredibly long explanation of how much better looking Patrick Swayze is, right. and that that's <laughs> why. Um, and, and it's right. that kind of a joke that like I sort of took forward with Jim Downey, okay, yeah, from Jim Downey, yeah. Well, and, and to kind of just move us forward yeah, a little. Larry, but, yeah, Larry. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, sorry, so now, racing, yeah. So you, get, you go from Seinfeld, or sorry, you go from Saturday Night Live to Seinfeld. Now, at what, now, what point did you join Seinfeld? This would have been uh, in 95, so this would have been Larry's, what was Larry's last season. So oh, this, wow. The season okay. that ended with Susan dying. Okay, wow. Yeah. So, so George gets engaged at the beginning of the season. So that's so one with Larry, two without. Wow, yeah. so that's really, that's an, because at that point, again, Seinfeld is this yeah. juggernaut. And I was this watching show. it, and you know, again, yeah. lucky enough to be the fan of it, too. Um, yeah. I, I, I know that the writer's room there is very different than any other writer's room. It was room. honestly not a writer's room, right. which was also a really, and that's something I have very much taken forward, which is, like, Larry really taught me that individual writers on a show should have a responsibility for their episode, meaning on Seinfeld, um, in my episode, I was the one pitching the George story, the Jerry story, the Elaine story, as opposed to we're all in a room and it's your turn to write or your turn to write, yeah. even though I'm the one that put all four ideas in. Exactly. And so the writer would write his draft and in a perfect world bring that draft to table. Now, it didn't always happen. Larry and Jerry definitely stepped in, but that was, they had no, they had not come up in the sort of network TV system. Yeah. Therefore, they had no reason to run a show that way. And to this day, I know that's how we do yeah. the show. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, structure. Larry taught me structure, too. Yeah, no, <laughs> but yeah, no, and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. I was going, but, but it's like, but but now, like, so when you when you're putting together a show, what do you, like, what are you, like? So you're basically, are you let your writers do when you're do you let your basically, writers? Basically, I mean, Veep obviously un, has a little bit more of an ongoing narrative, right. which obviously we sort of have to kind of stay on yeah. top of a little bit, as opposed to just purely episodic, go off and write yeah. an, a, an idea. So usually. There's, we spend a couple of weeks sitting around just kind of talking about like overall concepts. Yeah. And we kind of sort of start to lay them into piles of things. And then I really do try and sort of send that writer off who's really kind of hit a certain yeah. area more than, say, another writer. And then they're the ones that are really going off, bringing it, taking it to outline, doing the draft. And then I'm working, obviously, with them sometimes. Right on top of them or simultaneously, but really it's me and that individual writer. Now, don't get me wrong, we will punch up in a room. We will sure. try and make it funnier, but what we're trying not to do is create from scratch in a room with groupthink. The, the, the purpose of this method is that you're sending a writer off and basically trusting them to sort of outline this thing to whatever they think it should be and then write it the way they think it should yeah. be. And I just think it's an, I mean, and I, you know, that's, that's Larry. That's pure Larry. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. And that is unfortunately all the time yeah, that we sorry, have. Guys, but thank but, you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. And um, here is a little video that I don't know what it's about, but it'll probably be pretty exciting. <laughs> <laughs> So my father was my mentor. He had been a sound editor uh, since the mid-50s, and 
So he had a, his own company, and I worked there over the summers and when I was in high school. I started working for the WB Network when it first started, and Jamie Kellner saw something in me that was more than just a freelance uh, set rat, <laughs> and he really took an interest and made sure that I started to understand story structure and he understand how shows were put together and the budgets and so forth. I was in hair school actually and I got this opportunity to go work at Arena Stage in DC and I was lucky enough to work with this uh, gentleman named John Aitchinson who was a wig master there and he taught me everything I needed to know in the business. It was, it was amazing. It was like a free uh, graduate program. For me that was uh, uh, Mr. Shoemaker. He was my uh, math teacher uh, at Jefferson High School, and he was the coolest. He helped me uh, to find my way to college, and coming from South Central, applying for college and going to school, and he really took lunchtime to help me with my applications and really pushed me. And by the time I finished uh, my junior year of high school, I'd finished all the math that LA Unified had to offer, and it started classes at UCLA. So it really was my entryway into going to college. Ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to Emmy nominee and Golden Globe winner for Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Rachel Bloom. And Emmy nominated writer for Inside Amy Schumer, Tammy Sager. Hello. Check. Hi. Mm -hmm. Tammy yeah. and I both just came from our writer's room, so this is our writer's room sheet. Yeah, we were like, we are very dressed up, and then we went backstage and we were like, we are not. Oh, we, we look not. like shit. But like, we show up in the writer's room and everyone's like, ooh, who's meeting the queen? <laughs> <laughs> um, so Rachel. Um, hi. Hi. When I first saw you perform, it was um, in the writer's room of How I Met Your Mother, where I work with your now husband, um, Neil Patrick Harris, no, uh, <laughs> uh, Dan Greger, and we were watching your video, which was well approaching a million views at that point, very quickly, it was for your song, Fuck Me Ray Bradbury. Right. If you have not seen this, Google this. And it was, I mean, it was one of those things where, it was, <laughs> as, of, as, a, as a lady comedy gal, I was like, where the fuck did she come from? And I wanted to know, like, because of this sort of, this overview of mentor is how did you, you starred, you wrote, you sang, it's a great video. And you were a baby and you did it yourself. Yeah, um, so first of all, I have to say, I know I'm here to talk about performing mentors, but I, so my, my husband is right there, um, he's, uh, a little older than I am, and so when he got um, hired to write on How I Met Your Mother, which was his first major TV writing gig, I was a singing waiter on a boat that went around Manhattan for tourists. That's what I was doing, so I found out that he got How I Met Your Mother um, while I was on the boat. What was the first song you sang? Uh, I'm so excited <laughs> by the Pointer Sisters. Did you really sing yeah, that song? Yeah, I did, and, and, I just, and I started crying. I mean, this is like a side note, and I went up to it's very hard to be um, like an aspiring actor in New York City. Everyone's kind of desperate and always thinking about themselves. And I'll never forget the first person I came up to to tell that he got hired to write for How I Met Mother. I mean, I was crying. I went up to this guy, David, who was a, a, a fellow singing waiter, and I went, my boyfriend just got hired for How I Met Your Mother. And David goes, that's so funny, because Josh Radner, who's on the show, is from my hometown, but I don't think he'd remember me. <laughs> <laughs> and I went... Hey, David, my boyfriend just got hired for How I Met Your Mother, and David goes, oh my god, can you write me a part? LOL, congratulations to him. Like, no one fundamentally cares about other people. Um, uh, <laughs> and then I had to get back to work, and I think I probably got under-tipped, as I did all the time there. And then you moved to LA, where everybody is super supportive. Yeah, where everyone's super... <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, but, but the point was, so I was still working as a singing waiter on a boat, and I think this is even before I re released Fuck Me Ray Bradbury, I went and visited How I Met Your Mother for the first time. It was my first time on a TV set. It was so cool. And I said hello to my best friend, Neil Patrick Harris. And, um, no, I'm kidding. Um, and the thing that struck me was every writer on staff was so nice that you'd all watched my video, or no, this was after Fuck Me Ray Bradbury, that you'd all started watching my video in the writer's room. And the fact that you were all supportive 
And I was still a waiter. And so you, this guy Chuck Tatham, who's another writer in How Met Your Mother, came up to me and I was 20, I mean, 22. I was a singing waiter on a boat and everyone said, how's your singing waiter gig going? Oh, by the way, nice music video. And, and uh, Pamela Fryman, who's the director of almost every episode of How I Met Your Mother, who's a genius, applaud for her. Yes, yes. you can yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, every time I visited set, Pam would ask me, how are you doing? How are the music videos going? And when I'm talking about mentorship, that was my first example of a television uh, set and, and a TV writer's room. And you all were the nicest people. And I really took that to heart. And it was such a great example of you do not have to be mean or inclusive or snarky to be a good writer, to be funny. Because I then got hired for my first TV writing job while he was still writing for Him at Your Mother. And I was the only girl and I was the youngest on the staff of all guys. And bless their hearts, some of them were not nice. And I remember having a long talk with you at a Christmas party yeah, about it. It wasn't great. I would cry every other day. Um, and it was so nice to come to a set where that basically wasn't tolerated. And so that really set a standard of you don't have to be mean to be funny. And I think that extends to my performing mentors. And when I think about performing mentors, I also think about my teachers. And the teachers that I had were people who both, the people, the teachers that I had who influenced me were both challenged me, but also very kind. Was this at NYU or in high school? Kind of both. I mean, every great teacher, and when I think about it, when I think about specifically what teachers I'm talking about, I think about NYU, any outside film and TV audition classes, and then of course the Upright Citizens Brigade, which we're mainly talking about right now. Um, well, maybe let's, yeah. let's actually talk about the Yeah, yeah, theater. sure, sure. So, so I, I guess folks yeah. who don't know, that's um, an improv theater. It was founded in New York. Um, and they 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 have an out. That's not how you say it. They have a branch in L.A. <laughs> uh, and it's class improv classes and shows seven nights a week. And we both did stuff there. Well, and you were already a superstar there because you are. This is why I wanted to talk. Yeah, about exactly. This. Yeah. <laughs> well, you are you were already a superstar from Chicago. Which, if you're a student, it just means I'm old. No. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have to understand, like, if you are an improv 101 student in New York, and someone is already doing all of the pro shows at UCB, and then let alone comes from Chicago, that's a huge deal. And so what I, the reason I wanted you to moderate this is I wanted to talk about specifically the women at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater as my mentors, because the, the inspiration for it was, I remember when Bridesmaids came out, and I was writing on that TV staff with all men, and there were all these articles of, okay, this is gonna prove whether or not women are funny. There were all these articles about women funny, women funny. And I just remember thinking, I already know women are funny, not for myself, but from seeing all of the women go up every night at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. And I'm, just, I'm, not just, I'm not just talking about you or Ellie Kemper or Rebecca Drysdale or any of the superstars there. I'm talking about just any given night on Herald Night, Maud Night, which is the, the sketch team night. It's just, I had already seen not only women being fearless badasses, but also women writing and performing their own material. And so the question of whether or not women were funny to me was old news. I didn't understand why we were talking about it. Yeah. And so you were so go, to go back to your initial question is where did this girl come from, and how is she doing this all herself? I had examples in everyone who was around me. My roommate uh, out of college was Alana Glazer from Broad City. Isn't I was that ridiculous. Yeah. We were paired together in college. Yeah, we were just we were we just, knew each other from our improv three hundred one class. And we decided to be roommates. She started doing Broad City while we were living together. But that's just what I wasn't like, you can write your own web series. It, yeah, that's what everyone was kind of doing. Everyone was, not to say Alana's not amazing. She's amazing. But it's the same thing with me. I had examples of women all around me writing and performing their own material because the material was not out there for them in auditions or mainstream media or whatever. I think the thing that was so um, fascinating for me about you and also about your show, about Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, is like I definitely have examples of like Elaine May was, she is the queen. Everybody who's interested in comedy, listen to old Nichols and May uh, albums. You can find them on iTunes. They're phenomenal. And she is, she is also ended up, she wrote movies and directed, but. She, queen of improvisation, but I'd never seen somebody do what you were doing with this like 
ridiculous musical theater background that is, in my mind, the most earnest, corniest thing in the world. <laughs> and yet you were able to explore something dark inside of it. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. we, we had the examples of Im women doing sketch and improv, but not this musical theater, musical bend on it. Like what made you feel like you could? Yeah, well, I was a musical theater major at NYU in a fairly rigid program. It's not a program at NYU anymore, but it was called CAP 21. And my schedule for two and a half years of college was three times a week, I would go to studio 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. I would do three hours of dance, lunch, and then I would do two hours of acting, two hours of voice and speech. So it was very, very, very rigorous. And so I really studied musical theater. We had to write essays about Rodgers and Hammerstein. We did an entire Rodgers and Hammerstein unit. And so I was given a, a quite an extensive knowledge of musical theater. And there was a time, musical theater was my passion, that studying it so extensively kind of made me um, want to push it away for many reasons. I felt like I didn't necessarily fit in. The program was kind of rigid. And I felt like I didn't maybe fit in. And also at the time, I had gotten on a college sketch comedy group, this group called Hammercats, and I fell so in love with sketch comedy, and I fell in love with the freedom of it because my whole life I'd said to myself, you have to be on Broadway, and I hadn't said to myself, you have to be a sketch comedy writer. So for the first time when I did sketch comedy, I was trying my best without fear of failure because there were no emotional stakes. But with musical theater, I had told myself, if you're not the best, you're nothing, right? Your talent is synonymous with your self-esteem. And so it took me a while to combine that freeing feeling that I had with learning sketch yeah. with my original love of musical theater. And I tried to figure out how to combine the two. And I remember asking people and they couldn't really tell me. I took a musical theater writing class at NYU. They kind of told me how to do it, but it was really just combining the things that I loved. And then I transferred at NYU from, from musical theater to experimental theater. And that's when you're really, I mean, you are doing, you know, somersaults on mats and crying and, you know, exposing your tits and, and then getting really into like the grittiness of, of, I mean, not to sound like highfalutin, but the grittiness of human nature in kind of an experimental, almost unformed way. And then so taking those kind of raw emotions that I'd learned in experimental theater and then translating them to both comedy and musical theater, it was kind of figuring out my own voice, but I had the template of watching people do it at UCB. Not with the same musical comedy voice, yeah. but people craft shows. And I have to say, this is weird, but one of my mentors is frankly my husband who's sitting right there. Um, I feel like we failed the Bechdel test <laughs> from the beginning of this, where I'm like, I knew about you from your boyfriend. I know, I know. Husband. But, but, but it really is in part of a community. It is, and I think that the thing, the reason I'm citing my husband is we were driving cross country, I was trying to develop a sketch show for UCB, I played him a musical comedy song that I had written to be part of the sketch show, and he said, oh my God, this is so unique. You should just do that for the entire sketch show. And I had seen him write and perform his own material at UCB. And so it was just kind of looking at people who led with example. And so I, so the musical comedy aspect of what I do, yeah, was me finding my voice, but I had such a precedent with watching people older and more experienced make their own work and film the things that they wrote. And so when I made Fuck Me Ray Bradbury, I had seen other friends do sketches. There was this sketch group called Landline TV that was made up of all people who are my age. And they were using this um, amazing cinematographer, this guy Paul Rondo, who's still a working cinematographer in New York, who was this one man band of, I mean, you paid him like 400 bucks for a day and he brought all of his equipment, all of this amazing lighting, and for the first time, sketch comedy started to look beautiful. And so when I made Fuck Me Ray Bradbury in, in 2010, we were just coming out of the kind of trend set by the landlord, the, fun, the first Funny or Die sketch in 2008 right. for things With to come. With Alan McKay and, his, uh, and Will, Will Ferrell. Ferrell and the little two-year-old yeah. girl. And so, and so some of the charm of that was it looking very homemade, and Friends of mine had just started to make things look really professional, and I thought, oh, well, I can make a very professional looking video. I can make video. like a Britney Spears level video. And I have to say, I'd written the song, and the Britney Spears idea, not to fail the Bechdel test, was my husband's. 
He right. was like, you should do a Britney Spears. And let's call that the male gaze, but it fucking worked. <laughs> it was a great idea. Well, uh, two, two thoughts I just wanted to get to. One is to with Shannon O'Neill, where you were talking about like having an example. Like I remember yes. seeing her one person show at UCB, which was like, it was like a talent show put on by female inmates at like the Charlie Sheen. Oh my God, I, you're prison. totally right. And it was so fucking fearless and weird. Like Shannon, like the, to me, the examples of like those women at UCB was no fear of failure. No, and, there was no, no. And no fear of not looking ladylike or not, no, I agree. So Shannon O'Neill, who is the current artistic director of the UCB Theater in New York, was my Improv 101 teacher. So already from the get-go. In Broad City, she's, um, what's her, the name's, uh, is her brother, uh, Abby's roommate's brother. Uh, I want to say Gemberling, but I can't remember his character's name. Oh, Bev Bevers, Bevers' yeah, yeah. sister, with a weird toe on her side. <laughs> That's Shannon. So she was my Improv 101 teacher, and so from the beginning at UCB, contrasted with my college sketch group, which was very male-heavy, um, I right away was trained by a woman who both was balls out funny, but also very supportive and not mean and knew how to give us constructive notes without being like, fuck off, that wasn't funny. And I'll never forget when I started at UCB, the big, the big person at UCB was Rebecca Drysdale, who's another, who's a friend of both of ours, who's another one of my favorite performers. And so already- The writer for Cam Peel for the whole season. Of she's on the uh, current season of Arrested. She's been on every, I mean, she's amazing and should be, I mean, every, there are so many people at UCB, not just women, but people who just, I don't understand why they're not A-list celebrities. Um, but just already from the beginning, seeing examples of women who didn't give a fuck. And I remember doing an improv practice group and one of our coaches, this woman, Megan Nuringer, who's another um, improviser at UCB said, it was me and my friend Becky, we were doing a two woman improv practice group and she said, you know the fat fucks at the theater? And I knew exactly what she was talking about. She was talking about these, these big guys who kind of just didn't give a fuck. Like these basically like guys who seem like Chris Farley, who, who are, wonderful and talented in their own rights, but they just, they walk into a room and they command a presence and they don't give a fuck. She said, be like those guys. What if you walked into a scene and thought you couldn't fail? And I think that women in general, I don't know if it's, whatever it is, it's society telling us that we have to walk into a room and apologize for who we are. I had learned to kind of be meek and defer to the men in my life and not want to step on any toes or be a bitch. And slowly I learned from watching women at UCB, oh, I don't have to worry about that. What if I walked in and was just myself and ballsy in the way that I saw men be ballsy? Well, we, we, we got the signal to wrap it up, so I will. But I just, I want to say like this, especially this last season of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, I feel like it took such a beautiful, dark turn also in your performance and that that is also something that we don't see in comedic song. Yeah, let's, I feel like somebody Thank you. Knows. And it was really cool and brave and exciting to watch. And um, I just want to thank you. And Tammy, I want to say thank you too. And, and we're talking about mentors. You are one I of my can't. mentors. I've been nope. watching you. I've been, but I have been watching Tammy perform at UCB for um, 10 years. And the fact that you knew my work and were so nice to me when, I, when he started How I Met Your Mother meant so, so much to me. And you, when I think about the idea that you don't have to be mean to be successful in comedy or funny, that you can be supportive and warm and also be a fucking amazing joke writer, you are like the prime example of that. So, so this is my lesson. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, that, that, that's my lesson to actually to people here is be nice because yeah. they will end up fucking running their own shows. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I've had the opportunity to uh, mentor many people throughout the years. For me, I find it incredibly important for us to not keep our knowledge and our experience to ourselves. Taking your story, which all of our stories are unique, but you can find something in each story that you connect to. And it's just, even if it's just a feeling you get from giving, because you'll get more than you'll ever give. That's just the way it is. You help someone, you see that light go into them, that, that energy alone could fuel you for a whole year. 
through the academy, um, I've been able to sit with the Fred Rogers Foundation and several people that have won the awards there. I've been able to be a mentor to learning how to get through that maze in Hollywood. It's it's this great place that has all these rules, but none of them are written down. And so it's always a pleasure to be able to say, look, you got to know this, this, and this going into any of these situations and, and helping them avoid all the traps that I definitely walked into most of uh, as I came up. And it's a joy to see these people really flower and, and turn into great professionals. It's important to give out and be helpful. And I, I, I take pride in all the PAs that I've worked with. Whenever I see them on a future project, they always come running up to me, I'm an AD now, look! And they're just happy to see me and like, you've taught me so much. It's really, it warms my heart when I see, see them now. They're like, they're doing huge projects now on their own. And I'm like thinking, God, maybe I had something to do with that. It's, it's nice to, to know you had a positive effect on someone's life. Welcome, Vice President, Programming and Development for Freeform, Carrie Burke. Principal and Founder, Invincible Media, Vince Manns. Executive Vice President, Talent and Casting for the CW, Lori Openden. Producer, Jamie Tarsis. Chairman, The Beckman Group, and our moderator, Preston Beckman. All right, the mega panel. Yeah. Yes, there right. There you go. This is, this, is, this is a current meeting. This is yeah, actually, yeah, if yeah. you think about it, this is the, the, the end result of um, all of us having contact with Brandon Tartikoff, who I think we're going to talk about, among other things, right, Jean? Um, because you've got programming, programming, casting, marketing, scheduling. So you pretty much have uh, a current meeting here. Um, anyway. So if uh, you have a show. We can pretty much take care of it for you. That's true. <laughs> That's right true. here. But it right. was once. That's twice mentorship, a week. right there. Yeah, once or twice a week, we would gather for an hour or two every morning to right. have these current meetings. And we have fun current meetings, yeah. and uh, I think uh, there's a way to start, uh, and then we'll just see where this goes. Uh, what was uh, who wants to start? You know, what was uh, your first interactions with Brandon, and how did he help you with your your career, Jamie? <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my honestly, my first interaction with with Brandon was a meeting with him, but I had the advantage of having a father that made shows for Brandon, and they were very close. So I got a meeting with Brandon. I didn't get a job because of that. I had to then run the gauntlet of who was at NBC at the time. It was Perry Simon and write a tremendous amount of coverage. But I also took a lot of lumps for when I got the job for being, having a dad who was um, actually doing shows for the network at the time. And there's an apo a horrible apocryphal story that um, my dad did a pilot for NBC and then in this big meeting that <laughs> Brandon was there. And I don't believe that I did this. I said to my father, but come on, we know, Dad, this isn't your best work. I contend I did not say that, <laughs> but that is a story I've had told to me many times. Yeah. I heard that he also said, Jamie, you weren't my best work either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I think I heard that. Was that okay. Yes. <laughs> um, Lord? Um, I was the cast. We're getting more laughs than Rachel Bloom. I just want, <laughs> right? I just want to make that clear right That's now. Okay. You think, if you think, okay. if you think broadcast executives aren't funny, wait, wait <laughs> until he opens up his mouth. Lori? I was a casting director on the original pilot of Hill Street Blues and on the show for about three years. And I met Brandon because that was an NBC show. And I developed a relationship with him. And suddenly being female and being married and having children was an asset because Brandon felt that the audience was more, could more identify with somebody like me and me with them than the typical casting director. So when there was an opening, he helped bring me over to NBC and um, where I was, I stayed for 14 years. And uh, it was a great ride, just a great ride. And he was a magnificent person that I loved working for. I'm just really disappointed this is not the choreography. Um, you can <laughs> stay. I put in a lot of work. Or you um, can just do a dance. There's no right dancing, now. apparently, at all. 
in this panel. Uh, Brandon, uh, I, I have a different story because I, I didn't physically work with Brandon that long because he hired me to become uh, co-president of marketing for NBC Universal in the uh, 90s, <laughs> slightly after, right after electricity was invented. So they, they uh, he, he uh, but his, his influence on me, on uh, many, many marketers, uh, uh, marketing people, started when he, he started in marketing. And, and what he did, even as simple as it seems now, he brought showmanship to marketing. He, he brought showmanship. He made it a, a, a true creative uh, uh, career. And that inspired not only me, but all the rest of us who were behind him. And then also, he became president of the network. Hey, I can do that. So uh, to me, it's not always learning exact, telling someone, telling you what to do, but sometimes it's bigger than that. It's just inspiration kind of thing. That was, that's my, that's what he did for me and for, uh, uh, you know, for many of us uh, at, at that juncture. Sure. And no dancing, apparently. <laughs> it's early. Yeah. It's still early. Yeah. Um, I uh, um, started NBC as an intern when I was still in college, and I got lucky enough that I was in the office of NBC Productions, which was kind of like Brandon's playground. Um, and he would just hang around in that office all the time and take us bowling. Um, and so, <laughs> so I got to spend an inordinate amount of time around him, and I was graduating college, and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life until I had that internship. And then I went, I cannot... I can't believe these are jobs that people get paid to do. <laughs> I want one of these jobs. I don't have to write, but I get to work with writers, and I get to be around shows as they're being created. And so I, um, I stuck around after I graduated and in tempt, I tempt, um, until Jamie had the good sense to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> the kindness I did. to hire me. And my first real job there was as um, assistant to Jamie. Um, and speaking of mentorship, since this panel is about that, we're the same age, but, but she certainly taught me, I didn't know my ass from my elbow, I didn't know anyone in this town, <laughs> anything about anything, and taught me a hell of a lot. Um, so huge gratitude to you. And, um, and then the thing about Brandon was I was Jamie's assistant, I'd been an intern, I was an assistant, and then an executive job opened up and I had to get coffee for everybody who came in to interview for that job. It was in the drama development department. And I wanted the job, but I was totally unqualified. <laughs> um, but he encouraged me, and Jamie encouraged me, and Warren and Perry were there at the time, and they encouraged me. And like Jamie, I ran the gauntlet. I had to like cover everything. I did fake network schedules. And at the end of the day, I got the job, and I won the job. I, I, I felt like I did. I did so much work for it. And he treated me exactly the same when I was an intern, when I was an assistant, when I was a temp, as he did when I was an executive. And that, that was a great lesson that I hope I haven't forgotten. <laughs> yeah. I, I had a different relationship with him because uh, he and I, when he became president of entertainment, I had just started at NBC and I spent the first 11 years in New York um, as a research associate and then went up to network. And back then, and I don't know if you guys felt the way, these network presidents were almost like legendary. It yeah, was like, you know, yeah, there, was, sure. there used to be this, annual, this uh, yearly meeting to kick off the HRTS, and they'd be up there, and they were like bigger than life. Yeah. And so I knew of Brandon, but I didn't know him until um, I moved up to the network part of research and um, was given Saturday morning as a day part to specialize in it, and the, and the best thing about Saturday morning was nobody cared about <laughs> it. Nobody, other than Brandon and, and Vince. Yeah, that's true. He had a, he had a show on. Uh, yeah, that sounded really bad, by the way. Okay. No, that's okay. It's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and um, anyway, so he uh, I went out one year and gave a presentation on Saturday morning and met Brandon, and that was like you know. Like, and then uh, we were going to set the schedule a couple of months later, and, and he started, you know, he started calling me and asking me questions. And I was in a room, and we had a scheduling board. We had a Saturday morning scheduling board. I think it went from like seven in the morning until one 
in the afternoon, you know, saved by the bell. And he goes up there and he puts up the schedule, okay? And I'm sitting there and he comes over and he hands me a tile. And he says, go up there. You know, and that was my first, ex that's when I realized, I think I'm gonna do this for a living, but it was just so exciting having Brandon Tarikoff hand you, yeah. a, a, you know, a, a tile and say, go and, and, and you know, and he listened and um, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, you kind of allude, we had, Vince and I had dinner last night, so we stole my line. Mm -hmm. But, um, <laughs> you know, what are some of the things that, you know, y you carried through your career from having known him? I mean, some of the philosophy, thinking, you know? I don't know if these are philosophy. Well, they may be, but they're just <clears throat> um, two things. I mean, there are many more. I worked for him for a long time, but there are two things that are particularly memorable. One was carried over from Grant Tinker, and the other one was that when we were at the NBC building, there was a time during that, that process where Brandon had been ill and he recovered. But the story as it's told is that in spite of what was going on with him, he took the stairs every day. And, rather, and it was three floors up, rather than taking the elevator, even though he was not in the best of health. And I remember that after I'd left NBC and the network was still housed in that building, every time I would come in to pitch a show as a producer, I would tell that story to the writers and whoever else I was bringing in. And I would say, we have to take the stairs because this is, the, this is kind of the legend that Brandon always took the stairs. And that is something that has always stuck with me. And the other thing, which I, I think is a vestige of Grant Tinker too, but Brandon sort of, oh, well, no, there was the, the Brandon thing was, don't tell me how the watch is made, I just want to know what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you that has been very, very valuable. It was valuable to us then, it's valuable to me now. It's sort of a, don't, I don't need all this crap, just, just get to the point, you know, and that was, um, an incredibly a valuable thing. That I, I, right. yeah. Yeah. I remember he used to say that um, if it, that you had to, when you were going to pitch a show, an idea for a show, it had, you had to pitch it within one sentence because that's about as much as sales could understand. <laughs> <laughs> and if, you, if you got the yeah. sentence, sentence two, they, you would lose yeah. them. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if any of you are interested, I remember his book he wrote, The Last Great Ride, which is inaccurate. There's been many great rides since then, but uh, I remember him talking about all the shows that were pitched to him. And um, he, what I, I learned the most from him, he was really good at casting and had a great eye for talent. But it was more about how he treated the press, how he treated marketing, how he treated the what we called at the time suppliers. I haven't heard that word in yeah. a long time, but mm -hmm. that's what it was called then. Uh, and he just had a natural charisma about him. And I used to watch that and thought, wow, that really works. There's a reason this guy has risen to the top and made so many friends in the business. He just treated people with his charisma and love, love, love television. Had a love for television from the time he was a little boy all the way through and uh, loved doing it. And he went on after NBC to do features and never loved it the same. Yeah. It yeah. didn't, it was yeah. the wrong place for him. He was a real TV lover. Uh, like I said, he, the creativity and showmanship that he uh, always had about him, that he it was always emphasized, that was something that was always in the back of my mind. When we were at NBC, we hired artists, really, not marketing people. We hired people who saw this as, uh, as a, a, a creative career, not just as marketing people. And it was fun. And he was always, whenever we did something, he was always in the back of our minds. I wish he had been there when we did Must See TV, but he was there, if you know what I mean. He was he was all part of that. What we did was we, we, we did big things. And we, we set a standard that, you know, we weren't just going to let things slide. We were always going to go for broke on, on every show was the best show we ever saw, even though they weren't. Not all of them were. No names would be mentioned. But uh, we, we, we put in, and he was, always, he was always there in spirit 
with us uh, doing that. Well, I, I, I always felt he was, he was very populist, even though we yeah. had you know, the, the Hill Street Blues and the St. Elsewhere. We also had Mr. T, you know, we had, yeah. we had yeah. the A-Team. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we put on. Uh, I, I remember when uh, Warren Littlefield, who we all worked with for quite a long time, Warren told me, when Warren asked me to come out and be the head of scheduling, he said he had told Brandon that he was going to ask me to do it. And Brandon said to him, uh, well, he's got an opinion on everything, and sometimes he's wrong. And Warren said, coming from the man who gave us Manimal and Mr. Smith. <laughs> so, you know, so, so it was always, what was great was that, you know, it, uh, it didn't all have to be premium television. It was, he, was, he was really interested in programming for, for the masses. And, and there's some really interesting stuff that we did back then. And, we were but, more into uh, the baseball averages. Uh, 330, we're batting 333. It's good. But I also think that the thing about him that was, I feel like, a little bit unique and, and specific and hasn't happened so much since then is every writer and creator who worked at the network loved him. He, bought, he liked creative people. He liked writers, and he appreciated them and nurtured them and didn't distance himself from any of those people and sort of leaned into those relationships in a way that I don't know necessarily that at this point with all the corporate <laughs> intervention happens so much anymore. It was a very, he had very intimate relationships with the people that created shows for him and that was his design. And I feel like it made them all feel like they were part of something that was bigger than their shows. And, and, and it was about this network and this atmosphere that Brandon created, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's so many more layers game. now, and it's just it's not as easy to do that. Right. And, and also back then, often. you we we were broadcasters, which I don't yeah. think is the case anymore. No, you yeah. kind of where, apologize for being broadcasters. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But by, by broadcaster, I mean you know you, you know Brandon knew about sales, and he knew about marketing. Mm -hmm. yeah. He obviously knew about scheduling, and he knew about programming, and and we were all you know brought brought up to know as much about the whole business as possible because, you know, if you said, oh, I'm just going to make the shows, well, you don't understand. There's all these other factors that go into it, including, you know, what, what's the sales point? So we were really, um, back then, there was a lot, uh, we had to know everything, which I don't think is the case. I don't want to sound like a get off my lawn, <laughs> old guy. But I don't think it's the case anymore where, where you know, you, you, you learn, you see the full picture. It's like you go in there and you just do your job. And I think it was, a, it was a just a different era back Well, this there. is my time for the CW plug because we're a very small network. We, we're <laughs> now up to 12 hours. So we're all on the third floor of our building. So we're more like that, I think, than the big networks are now. Right. I'm involved in marketing meetings and in scheduling and everything. We're all together because we're a small group. And I hope you're all watching because this is a young crowd, right? You're all Riverdale fans, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. OK, I'm done. Go. <laughs> it seems Boy, like sucking up, right? Yeah, that's for great. Carrie should I'm actually yeah. We're already halfway there. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll throw in the, uh, to your last question about what did we learn from him. Um, I thought a lot about that before coming here. And the, and the one thing that just kept, um, that comes up every time I think about him was this idea. He was the first person to say to me, every show has to be someone's favorite show. And that sounds so simple, like, OK, well, of course, they have to be someone's favorite show. But when you get into development and programming, and particularly in those days, and networks, we were from 22 hours a week and you're buying shows, you can sort of talk yourself into, well, some people might like that. <laughs> or we'll, we'll, we'll give that a, a go and just see. And, and that test of, is it going to be somebody's favorite show? And is it going to be enough people's favorite show that it's going to, um, that it's going to live really matters. And I, and I think the reason he kept those low-rated shows on when, that were so critically acclaimed in those years, the, the Hill Streets and the um, Cheerses and the and the well, LA Law wasn't low rated. That came on strong, but but they were someone's favorite show. Somebody was passionate about them, and I, that's something I think that really matters. You can get cynical in these jobs yeah. and trying to remember that you, 
Yeah, we, I mean, we, we definitely had a lot of fun. I also think uh, while we're up here, it's important that we talk about Warren a little bit, mm -hmm. Warren yeah. Lowfield, yep. because uh, even though all of us, um, you know, we work with Brandon and, and everything, I think really for most of, I, I think I'm speaking for all of us, uh, we, we flourished during those, the, the 1990s when, uh, when Warren took over from Brandon and, um, uh, you know, really, we, we had like the next iteration of, of Mussy TV. And I'll just tell one quick Warren story because, you know, there was usually there's something that um, you remember somebody told you something. And I remember uh, I was in some meeting and I used to hate it when people would tell me how to schedule a network. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I probably threw a hissy fit, whatever, and pissed a couple people off. And we walked out and Warren just calmly took me aside and he said, you have the ultimate second guest job. Hmm. And that was the best piece of advice I ever got in my life because I realized that no matter what I did, there was someone in that room who was gonna tell me, you don't know what you're talking about. And once I realized that, I think that's how I succeeded in what I did. And I don't know if anybody has any other Warren stories or a quick, um, he was a great boss. I yeah, loved uh, yeah, I for don't. Warren. He was. Uh, I remember uh, all the years I worked for Warren. It was like eleven years or something like that. He blew up at us twice, and he was right both times. Uh -huh. And that, I mean, I've had bosses blow up like every day. Mm -hmm. and, but Warren was a calm personality, and he really did bring out the best in all of us. I think, yeah. just because of who he was. He inherited that. Or, or had it natively, that showmanship from Brandon, that, you know, that sense that, and there was always, there was a twinkle in both of their eyes all the time that, you know, we got to go do these jobs every day that was this gigantic playground. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's show business. And we're the, we were the lucky few yeah. um, that, um, you know, that had, and, and I don't know, remember this coming from Brandon, I remember Warren saying this, um, about the halls of NBC in those days. He used to say, like, this is Yankee Stadium. Mm -hmm. You know, we get we used to come to work every day in Yankee Stadium where the best people come to work and the best writers and the best actors and creators and, like, how, how lucky we are. And somehow that affection for the shows and that affection for television and that joy, I think, translated to the audience. Well, yeah. I got the green light, so I guess we have to... Uh... Oh, yeah. See, see, I told wow. you. That was, yeah, see? that was fantastic. Just like childbirth. <laughs> Just like childbirth. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, yeah anyway, uh, it's great seeing everybody again. I mean, this, yeah. is, this really is right like a I'm, I'm happy that you said yeah. in the 90s instead of last century. So yeah, that's, that's true. That was a bad marketing. Right, right, right. But um, anyway, I, thanks. Okay. Nice. I think we're ready. Yeah. I did have a moment uh, with another mentor, uh, Roland Poindexter, who uh, the first time I ever had to pitch something for our president, uh, we did a practice one, and as soon as I finished, I ran in the bathroom and bah! <laughs> and he came in, and he's like, you can't get worked up about this. You can't think about all the money that's going into a project. All you have to do is sell the show to one person in that room and make them excited about it. And so whenever I have to pitch something now, that's always how I look at it, is just find that key person. I worked with a, a really amazing hairstylist. I asked her, I was like, so what's the, what's the best thing I, I should know about learn to be a department head? Like, what's the one thing, the key? She goes, just always say yes. As no matter what they come to you, no matter what situation you're in, just say, of course, I'll take care of that. Sure, I'll do that. There's a lot of things that I've learned over the years. And some were hard lessons and some weren't. If I can pass on any of the lessons that I've learned to help somebody that much, that's enough. That's all, you know, it just needs to be that much. Mr. Shoemaker was a really uh, quiet person and a man of a few words, but I think that uh, watching him with people probably meant more than anything else because he had a way of connecting to people. And uh, it was a thing that, that I've recognized in people who are successful. And it's the power 
of looking people in the eye and connecting to them. And that's a, that's a way where you meet someone right where they are. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome dancer, choreographer, producer, talk show host, and judge for the Emmy-nominated Dancing with the Stars, Carrie Ann Inaba. <laughs> Emmy-winning choreographer for So You Think You Can Dance, Mandy Moore. <laughs> and choreographer for Jane the Virgin, and our mom narrator, Ebony Nichols. Yeah! <laughs> My neighbors. <laughs> Hi, guys. I'm a private neighbor. Bill. Yeah, David right there and Bill right there. Sherman Oaks in the house. <laughs> so can everyone tell choreography is here? Yeah. <laughs> the dancers are in the building. And I'm so happy to be here. We just had a, such a good time backstage. Like, there's so much love between these two. This mentor-mentee situation is just really, really lovely. So we're gonna just jump right into it. And I wanna ask you, Carrie Ann, first. Oh. Tell me, oh, sorry, how you met Mandy. Like, where did this love affair begin? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so way back a few years ago. <laughs> just a couple. Was it like, I, I'm not good with dating. Okay, we're not gonna do it, but it was like early 90s. Yeah. Early 90s. Sure. We were taking a dance class by a Brazilian choreographer named Alex Magno. Mm. and. Um, he was incredible, and we used to do these, Alex would do these shows. I think we did something at Temecula. This is really my first memory of you, like the one that stands out. We did a New Year's Eve show in Temecula, self-drive, self-costume, all of that. You know, as dancers do, we provide everything for ourselves. <laughs> and he's like, let's see your costumes. And Mandy had laid out a sheet and all her clothes on the sheet by size and color and shape. And here's duos and, and like trios, and you can match here and this and that. And I was like, I love that girl. Just overachiever. Overachiever <laughs> anonymous right here. She was incredible. That's, that's what I remember Mandy. And Mandy was one of the most amazing dancers. She was one of those dancers that was very grounded. We came from a generation where dancers were like five, seven and up, and they looked like Barbie dolls. And we came from a generation that was very grounded and earthy and had power. Yes. And Mandy was the one that stood out the most to me. Aww. And were you choreographing that job? Or were you guys dancing together? No, we were together. dancing together. Oh, you were we were together. Yes. We were bookends. Yeah, we were all I love bookends. it. So bookends. we'd be in class and that I mean that was my first, you know, experience with Carrie Ann. It's, yeah. Of course I knew her as a fly girl. And then I, you know, <laughs> knew her that she was this amazing dancer on tour with Madonna and then I would be in class with her and I'd be like, oh my gosh, she's so amazing. And then we just I would always watch her in the groups and then we started dancing together in this company and we we would, we'd be that we'd be bookends together. Always. And then you know, that's kind of where it all started. <laughs> and so where did it where, where did it start to turn into choreographer, assistant? Like, where, where did that start to happen after this whole moment with the breaking down of the costumes? Okay, I'll so <laughs> Carrie Ann got hired yes. to choreograph a little uh, reality television show called Who Wants to Marry a Multimillionaire? Which was way you know, back. I mean, that was. Like I just the read start. that it was nominated for like of the 50th, 50 worst shows in television <laughs> history. That's right. We did that. Right, we did it. We did it. Yeah. <laughs> Booyah. And she was. Um, she was hired to basically like we had to stage all the Staging. contestants, right? Okay, and right. I remember her saying something like, "Hey, you know, I would really love your help." And we, you know, of course, we get along really well. And, yes. Um, yeah, I had no idea what we were about to get into. It was like the craziest job. And, you know, she was, of course, having to handle, you know, 50 some girls walking around, crazy girls, by the way. Like, who's on a reality show to marry a multimillionaire that they've never seen that's behind a curtain? Yeah, but I mean, come on, kudos to Mike Place, because that's still working, right? Smart. <laughs> Very smart man. <laughs> yes. But that was like our first job. Your first together. thing. And yeah. so tell me, Carrie Ann, what is your process as a choreographer? I think, you know, Everyone has their own process. You know, some people write things down, some people try it on their assistants, some people videotape themselves and then, you know, come into the room with it. Tell us what your process is. Sure, everybody has a different process. My process was a little strange. I'm yeah. very visual okay. and I'm very methodical and I'm OCD to the max. And so I would write everything down by counts and I would create charts. And before I even got the job, I had to make sure I would get the quarter inch scale plans. Yes. And I had these little figures, because in my mind I would think, okay, I'm gonna stage it this way. And then you get to the set and it's too small and your whole idea is messed up and you only have two hours to rehearse, right? So all of this stuff, it's like, okay, how am I gonna do this? So I would write everything out. I would 
put my little figures on my map. I had 50. Wow. Because I would do a lot of pageants. So yeah. I make sure that 10 people across the stage can fit. And that way, when I walked in, I was really comfortable. Also, I had plan A, B, C, and D, <laughs> just in case, because people yeah. change their minds. So I never wanted to look stupid or silly, like I right. didn't know what I was doing. You know, as a choreographer, you're leading all the movement on stage, and you have to be department head. Yes. And you have to know what you're doing, no matter what anybody else says who doesn't understand choreography. So that was always my process. I had charts for everything. <laughs> How many charts? I'm like, what chart are we at? Chart B? Chart C? I thought I was making like script revisions. Mandy's like, okay, we're on chart blue, yeah. chart C. Ch yeah. Yeah. Well, we all know that Mandy's the choreographer of La La Land, yes? <laughs> so if any of you have seen the behind the scenes, uh, footage of La La Land, then you know a lot of what Carrie Ann just said has a lot to do with how Mandy choreographed that movie. So give us a little insight, Mandy, into what Carrie Ann taught you. Well, it's, I have to be honest, this is kind of a trip to talk to her and about this, because I'm like, I feel like I'm catapulted back however many years and listening to her actually like used to teach me how to do it. Because honestly, I never, I, when I started as a dancer and, a, and wanted to be a choreographer, I, you know, like many young choreographers, just thought it was about steps. Yeah. So I was just like, well, we just go in the studio and we make up steps. That's how it works. And for Carrie Ann, what was so, I think, so incredibly important for me to learn is that it wasn't, like that was the last thing that you do. Mm -hmm. and, I remember specifically being in rehearsal. I think we were on a show called All American Girl, another really great show, really great <laughs> reality show that we did. But we, you know, and they were more performance-based numbers where, where we actually had the girls singing and dancing. And right. she would <laughs> write out these charts and the way that she would write them was just fascinating to me. And I would have to sit next to her and we'd check our notes and it like became a thing that we would do. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I think she knows this, but honestly, still to this day, that's what I do. I've I write you. down yeah. everything. I didn't know that, that you still do that. Yeah. Oh, if you saw my clipboard, you would probably cry because it's almost exactly the way that we used to do it. And we used to actually do the clipboard. That? Oh my God, you're the queen of the clipboard. <laughs> yes, I love the clipboard because you can put it all in there. You have it all in there. <laughs> um, but do you remember we used to have disagreements about? Yeah what was front, okay, because this is gonna sound really weird to you guys, but basically would like segment out the piece of paper, you know, like in quarters yeah. or something. And an Excel document, the, it's yes. an Excel document. Yes. With the counts and the words and the lyrics and then the type of movement and then the camera angles and who's in what and who's singing. And what where, mic. What the yeah. formation is. Mm -hmm. And I would always do it from the audience's point of view. So like my formations would be one way. And then I looked at hers and it was flipped 180. I like, how, wait, did I do that wrong? She's right. like, no. Oh, no, I do it from like, I'm on stage. So like, I'm in it and I'm seeing the stuff. And I was like, oh, brilliant. I didn't even realize because I would look and I'd be like, why is my ex not look like your formation? Something's weird. <laughs> it would take us a long time yeah, to figure it out. You're but like, then when we did, I was like, oh, okay, are you doing from audience? Or are you doing from performance? You'd be like, performer. I'd be like, okay, okay, I got that. I got that. I get it. <laughs> I mean, that's fantastic because having worked with you, I've seen you do that. And I remember seeing you do exactly that and thinking, I was like, I wonder where she gets all this from. Her so fault. it's lovely to know that it came from you, Karen. But it's helpful, right? Yeah, it works a lot well. Because it pe keeps everybody on the same page. Yes. It's hard to speak dance. Yes. So at least if you have a chart, they get at least the outline of it, which I thought was really helpful. Well, and we'd go into rehearsal and sometimes you know, she'd be taken away for something, you know, a producer had to talk to her or she had to go talk to the director. And if I, as an assistant, didn't know if we weren't on the same page, right. literally, if we didn't have the same exact <laughs> yeah. notes, Which chart? I, you know, I wouldn't be able to continue to run rehearsal if she was pulled out or, you know, it's just a really great way for everyone yeah. to understand the same thing. And I just want to clarify something. Please. This word assistant. Mm. It's a, such a strange word because I don't believe, like some people think that there's a hierarchy to choreographer and assistant. And I've always believed this from day one from working with Barry Lather. I was his assistant. They're different jobs. Yes. They are not, one is higher than the other. One is, I think the choreographer is designed to push the artistic vision forward mm -hmm. and cre cre keep creating new ideas for and satisfy the needs of the producers and the directors. But I feel like the assistant is in charge of making sure all of the business of it happens. Like, yeah. there's no way I could have done anything that I did yes. without Mandy. I mean, we were like yin and yang together, and that's it's collaborative. That's the beauty of choreography. It doesn't happen alone. No. Right? It's and she would always say, like, I want two people on my team, three people on my team, four people on my team, because that's always 
it's better to have four voices or mm -hmm. two or three than just me on my you know mountain alone saying this is what should, we should be doing. Yeah. Yes. And that's another thing that I feel like I've taken away is like I really like to listen to my team and I respect everyone who, who works with me because she taught me that as well, that I never felt mm -hmm. that when I was in the room it was like, you're below me, right. you just do this. I always no. felt an equal in a way of, of work and, and responsibility, which I think is huge. That's fantastic, and it is huge, because we all want to be dancers, but then we all want to hopefully figure out, do we want to be choreographers? And yeah. so it's that respect level that I think is really important that can, it's very, you know, it's very evident, excuse me, between the two of you, it's quite lovely. So, Carrie Ann, after 26 seasons of Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> Is that not amazing? 26. Those grits are crazy. <laughs> Man. Tell me the difference between being in front of the camera performing and now being, you know, and still in front of the camera, but behind a little bit more, sitting and, and, and judging, and then Going also being a forth. producer and being a talk show host. And, you know, there's so many different hats that you wear now. Um, do you have one that you prefer more over the other? Actually, I, I've always loved choreography the most. Yeah. In my mind, well, look, I'm going to start to cry. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to oh. cry. This isn't a Dance with the I Stars know. episode. It's not going to happen. Um, I have always loved the choreography part. My mind is always thinking in pictures. That's how I see the world. That's how I process the world. I'm very visual. Mandy knows this. And um, it's been very hard to transition to somebody who speaks. But then today, as I was thinking about this, yeah. I was like, actually, now, 26 seasons later, I'm not throwing up before every show. Mm -hmm. I know I feel more confident now speaking, and I found my voice. And so I'm extremely grateful that dance is what brought me to actually finding my voice when it's dance that I went to because I felt I didn't have a voice. Right. So I'm, I feel really grateful. You know, the dance has taken me this way, and now I feel more comfortable speaking. But of course, because of that, now I want to go back and I want to do more creative projects because my mind needs that. And you, once you're comfortable someplace, I think you got to move on. Yeah. Right. I'm not saying I'm moving on from talking and things like that or speaking, yeah. but I just want to do more of the creative stuff and challenge myself. Mandy was just talking about a project she's working on, and it got me so excited because she's like, it's nerve-wracking. I'm like, for you? Yes. <laughs> Even for you, Mandy Moore, who has 9,000 ideas and is the hardest working woman in this business. <laughs> it's and true. so creative yeah. and so loving. Mm, thank you. It's true. You have to like push yourself all the time. And again, like I know this is, night is about mentors, and I, I'm so lucky to have had somebody like you because I do feel like you always gave the space for me to do what I do. Like I, I like counts, I like shapes and you know, she'd be creating and she'd do it one way and I would just like be a machine about trying to make sure I did it exactly the way she did it. And then two seconds later, she'd start on a different leg. And I'd be like, that's not what we did, Carrie Ann. <laughs> oh, I had no time. But uh, that's fine. I don't, this, I'm feeling more this this time. And I'm like, yeah. okay. But it's like, we no. were so hysterical that way. Like, I remember yeah. those moments. It was so good. It and was always be, when they came in the room, yes. she was like, the first time I'm showing, I'm like, Mandy, I'm going to show them. She's like, no, I got it. I'm like, I'm going to show them. And I do it all wrong. She's like, that's not really doing? what we did. That's not but, at all, but you're and doing. now being a choreographer, I do the same thing. Yeah, I do. <laughs> like, and I laugh with my dancers all the time. I'm like, for some reason, you become a choreographer and you don't know the counts anymore. Yeah, right. And you can't start on the correct leg. I don't know what it is. It's so crazy. <laughs> it's because you're thinking big picture. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, we'll just say that. I like that. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me the magic, Mandy, of when you're at Dancing with the Stars yeah. and when you get to sit next to Carrie Ann oh. and you guys are judging and sitting there together. Like, how does that feel? Ebony, come on. I, I mean, like, this, okay, so that particular episode where I, I got to be a guest judge, I mean, first of all, I felt like. She was our best guest judge in the oh. history of Dancing <laughs> with the Stars. She actually gave critique yeah, really and good. helped the dancers. Thank you. You have no idea what it meant to me to like sit next to you. I mean, like, is this so? I mean, this night is a trip for me too because I just, you know, it's like when you, a huge part of who I am in this business was built and nurtured by you. And so to sit next to yeah. someone who's done that for you and then to feel like, she it, she allowed me to sit in my own seat, you know, and like was such a support. We're in hair and makeup, and she's like, "Oh, you look amazing! I will. Should we do this?" And she like got me a candle, and I was just like, "This is awesome! This is the way our industry needs to be. More of this. Yeah. I, I believe that you can. You know, I've always felt like you can." leave space for this person to be awesome and you can be awesome too, you know? It's like there's a slice of pie for everybody and not everybody thinks that way and I'm very fortunate yeah. to have somebody who helped me that way. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, Mandy, yeah. what is 
the one thing that you feel that you've learned from Carrie Ann that you carry with you into every rehearsal? Is there one ism or is there one thought that you, you know, that yeah. you, that, that every day resonates with you? Yeah, I mean, other than the charts. I mean, other than the charts. Given. The, yeah. charts. <laughs> the charts. Um, I just, uh, for me, I learned so much about how to behave on set and how to stand my ground as a woman and how to communicate with people and be a leader without being a dictator. Mm. And I, that's all from Carrie Ann, because I think that, she, uh, you know, I watched her be incredible with producers, directors, talent. Um, I watched her make changes and like yeah. all of those things. It's like, you don't know how much of an effect you have on people until it's like, yeah, I'm doing those things that I learned from you. So thank yeah, you. Thank you. My gosh. And anything you learned from Mandy, Carrie Ann? Everything. Mm. <laughs> This girl is like, you're not a girl anymore. Are we girls anymore? And I, I say girls, so, we're girls. Are we women now? Like, oh, yes. Yeah. Um, we, um, okay, one of the funnest things that I've learned about from Mandy, there's just so many things that are all racing through my mind, but the thing that stands out the most is Mandy taught me how to treat people. So I'm super like tunnel vision. I'm in charts. I've got 15 versions and I'm like, got to get it done. And we have seven minutes, Mandy. We're going to do 12 numbers. We have three minutes each number. We're going to do it like this. And she'd be like, a boo boo, which is what she calls me, a boo boo. <laughs> <laughs> a boo boo, did you eat lunch today? I'm like, she's like, did you, do you know what that guy's name is? And I, I'm really good with faces and I'm really good with people. But she taught me, you need to stop and you need to talk to people. And, but I'm like, how? Because I'm really shy and I'm a bit antisocial. Like I, I feel really uncomfortable and nervous around people. And she would be like, you just need to ask them where they're from. Mm. Do you remember that? Yes. You're like, that's all you need to do, Carrie. You just need to ask them where they're from and that'll start a conversation and then just have the conversation. And she taught me how to be a person yeah. in this industry. And in this industry, you need to have balance. Look at Mandy on set. Yes. Whether you're a producer or you're a dancer, you know you're gonna be okay. She's one of those people that just, you know she's got it all under control always. Even if inside maybe she doesn't. <laughs> As everybody, time. right? Yes. But you always, when I looked in your eyes, I always knew it was going to be okay that together we would figure it out, yeah. and we always would. Yeah. And that's such a gift because it this is. business, especially as a woman in yes. this business, it can be really daunting. Yes. And you want to represent, and you're trying so hard to put up a strong front and make like you know what you're doing. And half the time, none of us know what we're doing. We're yeah. all making it up. That's kind of the beauty of this business. Yeah. We get to make it up as we go along. Oh, 100%. Right? <laughs> and to that point, I assisted Mandy on the Grammys last year, and, I, and, and this is a true story. I, I watched Mandy speak to lighting grips, to, I mean, I, I'm losing my thought, but it, you know, so many people and everyone knew Mandy and Mandy knew every single person by name and I yep. watched it myself. So I know exactly what you're saying, Carrie Ann. There's something about Mandy that is infectious and it's honest and it's real. And I'm, I'm glad to have had this moment with you because it all comes full circle and it all makes sense and it's so it's lovely. I know. <laughs> It's a lot of love up here. Lastly, Mandy, before we go, what has it meant to have Carrie as your mentor? Um, as a woman navigating the industry, I'm gonna say to have another strong woman who uh, leaves space and uh, supports and sends text messages or calls yeah. or, you know, we're about to go live at Dance with the Stars and I always look over at her and I'm like, God, I have a great show and she's like, thanks, you know, like yeah. it's just so wonderful to know that you have someone who's a friend but also a collaborator and a peer, um, you know, because it can be kind of a, you know, a lonely world at times but also in the industry you can feel very isolated and kind of like you're on your own island, yeah. you know, so it's wonderful. Now it's all reversed because on Dance with the Stars, yeah. she's a producer and the choreographer for all of the numbers. And <laughs> and now when we have to dance, I'm always like pooping in my pants. Right. I'm always like worried because I'm a judge and I know everybody's going to judge what I'm doing. Right. And I look at Mandy and she's now she guides me. Mm -hmm. And it's mm. so beautiful to have the reversal of roles this way. Yes. Even though it was never one way, it was always give, right. give, 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 support, support. But now it's beautiful to sit there and then when there's a dance number, I go, Mandy, she goes, oh, boo-boo, you're going to be fine. Be fine. Yeah. You're going to be fine. I and got you. If Mandy's there, you are always going to be fine, mm. for sure. Thank you. I love you so much. On that note, we say thank you. Yeah. We stand. Thank you. That's all we stand. We're quite yes, that's it. And we say goodnight. <laughs> that's it. And then we all go home? And then we all go home. Uh, <laughs> you're so good.